both of the AIMS universities institutional biosafety committee for their support and uh, uh, helping in implementing bias, uh, sorry, biosafety and biosecurity month. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, today's speaker, Ms. Uh, Azarina from Ministry of Environment and uh, Water. She is going to give a talk. So uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Azarina for accepting our invitation. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Maha because he is going to moderate today's session. So we are lucky we have Dr. Maha to moderate this session. So just a little bit, uh, I want to highlight about Dr. Maha because uh, Dr. Maha is very popular in Malaysia and beyond. I don't need to spend much time <laughs> to introduce uh, Dr. Maha, but just want to highlight a few things. Uh, Dr. Maha is, uh, Maha is having a, a, her PhD in science communication from uh, University of Malaya, which is oldest university in Malaysia. And uh, uh, she is uh, well known uh, for her, I mean, uh, contribution as a science communicator, uh, especially in agri biotechnology. She is also uh, among uh, world's 100 most influential people in biotechnology. So that one is something great uh, for Malaysia and uh, for all of us uh, to have Maha today. Then, in addition to that one, I just want to highlight she is a global coordinator for international service for the acquisition of agri uh, biotech uh, applications. She is the executive director of Malaysian Biotechnology Information Center, which is called as MABIC. Uh, she is a founder and editor in chief of the Petri Dish. Uh, she is also a, a international consultant uh, for United Nations uh, FAO biosafety project, which is implemented in uh, Sri Lanka. She is a co-founder of uh, Science Media Center of Malaysia, and uh, she is also uh, teaching in uh, different universities. Uh, she she is also serving as an adjunct faculty member in uh, Monash University, uh, Malaysia campus, as well as uh, Ames University. And in addition to that one, uh, I mean, uh, she's doing a wonderful job at national, international level. So we are lucky to have uh, Dr. Maha. So uh, thank you, Maha, for accepting our invitation to uh, become a moderator of this session. So uh, uh, my special thanks also goes to student volunteers. Those are helping us uh, to implement biosafety and biosecurity month activities. So uh, once again, thank you all of you. And uh, without further ado, uh, please, uh, Ms. Ko, uh, please lead the way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shubash. Now, I request moderator of the webinar, Dr. Mahalechumi Arujanan, to introduce the speaker and start the section. Dr. Mahalechumi, please. Very much, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Subash. Thank you for the trust you have me. You have in me to moderate this session, which I think is very, very important, and also a session that's very close to my heart. As Dr. Subash was saying, I'm involved in biosafety um, regulations and outreach program in various countries and uh, in Malaysia as well. Now, why is agri biotechnology so important? Uh, because agri biotechnology is what is going to give us the food security. And we are saying that every country, including Singapore, is actually racing to increase their food security. And um, we are also facing a big, huge challenge, which is hovering our, over our head, which is climate change. And we need to mitigate climate change. And it cannot be business as usual in uh, agriculture. Farmers need new seed uh, varieties so that they can still have the same yield and productivity in spite of climate change. And we want to uh, elevate farmers from poverty. We want to have more younger farmers coming into agriculture, which is a big issue around the world. And more importantly, because like what Dr. Subash was saying, I teach in a number of um, uh, universities and also I go to schools to encourage students to take STEM education. So where are we going to put all these graduates upon gradu uh, graduations? We need industry to support them. And for that, we need a strong agri-biotechnology research and development so our graduates can then take up positions in research. So we need, I know this is youth empowerment in agri-biotechnology. Uh, so these are the benefits, but of course, today we're going to talk about biosafety. Pona Zarina is here. I will introduce her in a, in a, in a bit. Um, but having said so, we need to be very conscious about the risk 
uh, or the potential risk that new technologies bring in. And that is why we have the biosafety law and Malaysia has got a very excellent biosafety law and it's being implemented. Juan Azarina will talk about that. So we need to look at how risk can be assessed, can be managed, and all stakeholders play a vital role in ensuring that uh, our biosafety law is implemented in a proper way, science-based, and everyone complies to it so that we can achieve the benefits as well as we can reduce that if there are any um, risk, which of course Puan Azarina will be talking about. So with that intro, let me introduce our speaker, Puan Azarina Yahya. Um, Azarina got her uh, degree in genetics and molecular biology from University of Malaya, and then she joined Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. At that time, it was called NRE as an Assistant Scientific and Technical Consultant for the Biosafety Secretariat. And while she was there, she was very instrumental in implementing, uh, uh, being involved in matters that uh, were, it, uh, was related to implementation of the Biosafety Act 2007, and uh, also in developing the regulations related to the Act. And she was also instrumental in setting up the um, Biosafety Department. And uh, when the department was set up, she took a position as a um, research officer. Uh, and currently, she's uh, also involved in uh, as an assistant director in the research and evaluations uh, section. Her main role is as a secretary to GMAC, which is Genetic Advisory, uh, Genetic Modification Advisory Committee, assisting GMAC in reviewing various uh, applications related to LMOs or living modified organisms. And um, she's also uh, supporting all the subcommittees that is under the National Biosafety Board. She does consultation with various parties and she also does um, training for biosafety, uh, biosafety for all the uh, related parties who are involved in this um, in this field. So with that, I would like to invite Ms. Azarina to start her session. Please welcome her. Thank you very much, Dr. Maha. Um, good morning, everyone. So uh, as Dr. Maha said, we go way back, even Dr. Maha was involved during the uh, stakeholders consultation for the Biosafety Act. So today's um, I suppose today's presentation won't be anything new for Dr. Maha herself, but for everyone else, uh, those who are um, maybe not familiar with the Biosafety Act, I will, let me just share my screen. Okay. Give a presentation entitled the Biosafety Act and what researchers need to know to comply with the Act. So the roadmap of my presentation will be, I will speak a little bit on the Biosafety Act and then the role of the Institutional Biosafety Committee. Uh, I will introduce this committee and how they help institutions to comply with the Biosafety Act and then how you as a researcher can play your part in complying with the Act. Okay, so biosafety. What is biosafety? As a researcher, I suppose biosafety is uh, nothing new. It's not a new topic, okay? You can Google the biosafety and you get all sorts of different, um, different interpretations, different definitions, sorry, of biosafety. But basically it's the safe handling on, and containment of infectious microorganisms and hazardous biological materials. So that's the general uh, definition, well-known definition of biosafety. But when we speak about the Biosafety Act, okay, in the context of the Biosafety Act 2007, biosafety is described as efforts to reduce and eliminate any potential risk that result from modern biotechnology and its products. So the key word there is modern biotechnology, okay? And um, what is the main um, goal? It's to make sure that we minimize any risk of modern biotechnology, any risk that it may pose to humans, plants, animal health, the environment, and biological diversity. So it's all encompassing. It's not just, oh, just human health. For example, biosafety, if you're working in the lab, you know, you're worried about maybe the personnel working in the lab. But in the Biosafety Act, we, we are worried about, or we want to take care of everything, not just the humans, but animals, plants, and um, the environment. So the scope of the Biosafety Act is limited to modern biotechnology. That's the key word. We know biotechnology, it's a very wide. A lot of techniques fall under biotechnology, but modern biotechnology is just a subset of uh, biotechnology as a whole. So examples of modern biotechnology would be um, 
cell transfusion, transfection, transformation, okay? And under the Act, there is a definition of modern biotechnology. So, just go back to the slideshow. So, under the Act, the definition of modern biotechnology is in vitro nucleic acid techniques, which include recombinant DNA. So, it's not solely recombinant DNA. It's actually in vitro nucleic acid techniques, including recombinant DNA, and direct injection of nucleic acid into cells or organelles, or the fusion of cells beyond taxonomic family that overcome the natural physiological reproductive recombination barriers that are not used in traditional breeding and selection. So that's the definition of modern biotechnology under the Biosafety Act. The objective of our Biosafety Act is to establish a national biosafety board that regulates the release, the importation, exportation, and contained use of living modified organisms, and also the release of products of these LMOs, with again the objective to protect human, plant, animal health, the environment, and biological diversity. Now we get this question often, why the term LMO? Why don't you just say GMOs? Because you know, GMOs, um, the term GMOs is much well known. So actually in the context of the Biosafety Act, LMO and GMO, we use it interchangeably. So it still means GMO. The reason why we're using LMO is because it's the term that was uh, agreed upon, the legal term that was agreed upon. So in the Biosafety Act, there's also definition of living modified organisms and products of LMOs to make it easier. So in the Act, LMOs are defined as living organisms that possess a novel combination of genetic material obtained through the use of modern biotechnology. So it's the same as uh, GMOs, novel combination of genetic material from modern biotechnology. And the products of LMOs are products that are derived from LMOs where, whereby they contain detectable recombinant DNA or Let's say they, you can't detect the recombinant DNA, maybe due to um, the processing and all that. However, profile characteristics or properties of the product is no longer equivalent to its conventional counterpart. So an example would be, um, let's say, uh, GM soya. Well, if you were to process it to make, let's say, oil or something like that, course, you know, you can't detect the recombinant DNA anymore. However, let's say the oil that was produced through this GM soya, the profile, the characteristic or property of this oil has changed. Maybe it's more, uh, the nutrients has changed, you made it more nutritious, or perhaps, uh, you know, more, the color has changed, like normal oil would probably be like yellow or something, and this oil, you made it uh, a different color. So the profile characteristics is different from the conventional counterpart. So that's also a product of an LMO. Now, why? What are the concerns? Why are we concerned about uh, LMOs, GMOs? Okay? Obviously, you know, when you work with uh, to create a GMO, LMO, what is the objective of creating it? You don't want to make something that is already there, right? As researchers, you want to make something that is uh, better, improved, different. So as with everything in life, you know, nothing is um, risk-free, especially if it's something new, you know, you have to get used to it and all that. So the concerns are like, for example, impact environment. If you were to create, um, say a GM plant, okay, we are concerned that whether there might be possible impacts to the environment, would it have a potential to um, colonize the environment, perhaps become weedy, or uh, transfer its genes on to maybe other um, plant species. In fact, actually, if you, even if you don't look at plant GMOs, normal plants, you know, they can become invasive alien species. So if that can happen with normal plants, or oh, who knows what more with the GMOs, okay? And for the human health aspect, you know, if you create a new Proteins. Okay, we don't know the impact of these proteins. May, maybe the effect of these proteins, whether you know it may cause allergenicity or toxicity 
to um, humans. Now, a little bit of um, history on why or uh, how the Biosafety Act, Malaysia's Biosafety Act came into play. Okay, Malaysia, I'll, be, I'll try to make this as short as possible. So basically Malaysia is a party to the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. So um, under this party, what re it requires is that parties, okay, must ensure all parties under this protocol need to ensure that any advancement made in modern biotechnology, okay, and any possible concerns rising from modern biotechnology will be addressed by the party. Okay, whether they want to address it, how they want to address it, either through uh, the regulations, policies, existing law, I mean, that is up to the party. So the main the main concern at that time was, or the main uh, reason for this Katahina Protocol on Biosafety was the transboundary movements of LMO. Okay. They were concerned that, you know, a country, for example, country A, would move the LMO from their country, perhaps another country, and they might dump the LMO in another country. So, well, excuse me if I'm using like uh, simple languages, but the, so to avoid any, you know, uh, any country from being a, a dumping ground of LMOs, okay, hence why they wanted uh, countries to be able to, you know, control um, and have a say in any transboundary movement of LMOs into their country. So that was the main, actually, the main uh, concern of the Katahina Protocol transboundary movement. Of course, for countries who decide or parties who under the protocol, they can actually opt to perhaps go above and beyond on how they regulate LMOs. So it may not just cover transboundary movement, it could also cover like um, research pertaining to LMO, GMOs, which is in Malaysia's case. So hence, for Malaysia, we decided to have a domestic, um, a new act, a domestic act covering uh, GMOs LMOs, specifically for GMOs LMOs, which is the Biosafety Act. Now, if during the beginning, you know, most uh, researchers uh, were wondering, you know, whether this Biosafety Act would it hinder modern biotechnology? Okay, when we if you look closely, actually, the Biosafety Act is an act that strikes a balance between our national policy on biological diversity and our national biotechnology policy. Why we say that is because under the national policy on biological diversity, strategy 11 of that policy states that we, Malaysia, needs to develop a policy to regulate Okay, biosafety, because Malaysia is one of the 12 mega biodiverse countries in the world. Okay? So they were worried about our um, biodiversity, you know, with uh, genetic modification technology coming up and all that. And, you know, they want to, we want to protect our biological diversity. So hence, uh, in the policy, it states that we should have a regulation or a law, a policy somehow to um, regulate biosafety. And then a few years later, the National Biotechnology Policy came out, which says that Malaysia should ensure the development of science and technology in the field of biotechnology. In other words, they want to um, make sure that, you know, we progress in terms of SNT. And the, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s was the time when genetic engineering was really booming and all that. So hence, the Biosafety Act comes in the middle because how we create an enabling, an enabling environment where yes, we say no problem. You can conduct your modern biotechnology activity, okay? However, when you do conduct the activity, just make sure that you minimize any risks that it may cause to the environment and to our health. 
So it's a, a, a way to balance both policies. And now we are actually in the midst of uh, revising our national policy and environment. And um, it may also have a, a probably a clause on biosafety as well, because you know that biosafety also plays an important part in our environment. So basically, the Biosafety Act, again, I reiterate that it complements our national policy and bi on biotechnology, as well as the national policy on biological diversity, and soon perhaps our national policy on uh, environment. Okay, it's a national law. I mean, that's not just applicable to uh, the federal states, but also to Sabah and Sarawak as well. So the whole of Malaysia. Again, it is not intended to disrupt R&D. If anything, actually, it helps researchers by giving researchers a clear direction. Okay, this is the regulatory framework that you should follow when you're doing modern biotechnology. Okay, uh, this is um, you know what you should be looking at and all that. And for investors in modern biotechnology, it would boost the conv confidence of investors because they see that oh, okay, so you have a bio safety act you are doing this research it complies to the biosafety act so we know that this research is very well i mean reg it's regulated well uh and it's it's safe so there will be you know the confidence in investing in perhaps your research it helps it helps researchers in that way and the implementing agency of this biosafety act is the department of biosafety and we are currently under the Ministry of Environment and Water. So under the Biosafety Act, there are a few components. There are about seven components. Okay? The Act talks about the establishment of a National Biosafety Board. Then it talks about the uh, release and import of LMOs and so on and so forth. Under the Biosafety Act, currently we have um, three regulations. Okay. Two new regulations. The one was the bios. One is the biosafety approval and notification regulation, which was uh, that one was uh, regulated. I mean, the regulations came out way back in 2010, and I think uh, most researchers, at least those who have uh, active doing active research, are familiar with this regulation. Okay, what basically is under the regulation? It it regulates the IBCs. Um, approval, notification activities, et cetera. Now we have two new regulations, which maybe this won't concern so much researchers because this is more on the regulatory side. We have the biosafety compounding of offenses regulations. So yes, that means that non-compliances to the Biosafety Act, okay, uh, there is a penalty for that. And then we have the biosafety sampling procedures regulations. So these are procedures for sampling and analysis. This is more on, um, as I mentioned, for those who are uh, the regulatory side, like for us and for those that we are working together with in taking samples at the port and so on. And then we have exemption for contained use activities and exempted things by the minister. So who is this National Biosafety Board, right? The National Biosafety Board consists of members from about seven um, ministries, okay? And why these seven ministries in particular is because they are the main stakeholders when it comes to um, modern biotechnology, genetic engineering, okay? we have the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, Ministry of Agriculture, Food Industries, Ministry of Science and Technology, of course, Ministry of Plantation Industries and Commodities, and the Ministry of International Trade and Industries, and we also have four experts in uh, biosafety. So who is the secretary to the National Biosafety Board? That would be our DG of the Department of Biosafety. Our DG will be the secretary to this board. And the chairman of the board will be our set gen from the Ministry of Environment and Water. So the NBB, they have a lot of functions, many functions, but what we, the main function or what people actually uh, see is that this NBB decides on all applications regarding approval and notifications. 
So uh, sometimes people get confused. You know, they think the Department of Biosafety is the one that is deciding, okay, uh, you know, this, uh, this research or this uh, re activity can, can um, receive, uh, you know, an, an acknowledgement, can receive um, uh, the green light to, 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 to go ahead. But no, we, we at the department, we do not decide anything. We are actually just the operating arms for the board. The board is the one that makes a decision on all applications. Okay? Now, uh, under the Act, okay, there's a provision for establishing a gen Genetic Modification Advisory Committee, or GMAC in short. Now, who is this committee? Because this committee actually plays an, a very important part. Okay? So this committee is a committee that consists of um, experts from many different backgrounds. As you can see, these are a few of the backgrounds that we listed. Okay? And these experts, what they do is they provide a, the scientific assessment for any applications that uh, come in regarding modern biotech. Okay? So they... Uh, we review it, uh, they assess it, okay, and then at the end of the day, they give their recommendation to the board. So all they can do is just recommend based on their scientific review. Okay? That's their main function. And then they also provide any other um, scientific technical advice that the board or the minister may require. Okay? Now, the Biosafety Act, again, the scope of the Act is limited to modern biotechnology. So all institutes or persons involved in modern biotechnology, be it if you are a public institute, a private institute, whether you are maybe one person doing a backyard biology in your, in your probably in your backyard, but you're still doing a GM work, okay? you are doing modern biotechnology work, then you'll be covered under the Act. As long as it's modern biotechnology, okay, you'll be covered under the Act. It doesn't matter what stage of uh, R&D, because it covers all stages of R&D and release. So from bench to market, from researching it to uh, releasing or commercializing it. Okay, It covers living modified organisms and products of organisms okay? and all types of organisms. So all types of LMOs, whether this LMO is a bacteria, whether it's a microorganism, whether uh, it's a plant LMO or insect, okay? as long as the LMO, it covers all types of LMOs and all activities. So under the app, we have a few activities. We've got contained use, whether it's contained use of the LMO, whether you're importing the LMO, whether you're exporting the uh, LMO, whether you're importing for re release and release. These are products of LMOs. Okay. What do we mean by contain use? What is contain use? Contain use means any operation, okay, which includes R&D, or perhaps you, you're done with the R&D stage, you're producing it, manufacturing it, okay, pro production, manufacturing LMOs, or you're just storing the LMO, okay, so any of these operations which are undertaken within a facility, installation, or any physical structure, that means within four walls, it is contained okay, to prevent the release, the impact to the, uh, to the environment. This is what we call continuous. So anything to do with LMOs within four walls, okay, not escaping these four walls, that is called contained use. For example, so this covers labs, uh, glass house, animal unit. Okay. Now, what's a release activity? So it's anything opposite of a contained activity. A release activity will be something that's out there. So it's not confined within four walls. So if, for, if, for example, if you're doing R&D, a field experiment, you're planting your LMO out in the field, okay? but that's a release activity. Even if it's still in the R&D stage, that's a release activity. So if you are supplying or offering to supply for sale or placing on the market, this is more for those um, Im importers, those importing, let's say, LMO grains because they want to uh, supply it to the market. Okay, So that's a release activity. And then we have 
disposal of an LMO, remediation, offers gift price free item, and any other activity which does not amount to continuous. So all that is a release activity. Now, there's actually just two regulatory processes under our act, notification process and an approval process, part four, part three of the act. So depending on what time of what type of activity you as a researcher are conducting, so that will determine which process you fall under. So research and uh, R&D, contained use, okay, or if you're importing something to conduct a continuous activity, okay, that falls under the notification process. If you are exporting the LMO, that's also a notification uh, process. Now the approval process, again, if anything that it's being released, like field trial, or direct introduction of the LMO to the environment um, for uh, sale or placing on the market, okay, those are all under the approval process. Why? Because those are release activities. Now, to, just to give you a clearer picture, uh, let's say I'm a researcher and I'm starting from scratch. So from bench to market, I'm doing R&D in my lab. Okay, then I want to acclimatize my, my GM plant in a transgenic glass house until the, I go to the field trial and this that successful commercial planting and perhaps placing in the market. So everything, all this, or every step is regulated under the act. It's just a matter of which process does it fall under. So you have R&D in the lab, that will be a notification. Transgenic glass house, you're still doing your R&D in a con contained environment that's all notification. And then once it's out, you have the approval process. So a brief flowchart of the notification process you as the applicant, if you're doing this is R&D, you have to go through your IBC, which I will talk a little bit more on the IBC later. And then the IBC will go to the Department of Biosafety and submit the uh, notification on your behalf, okay? So applicant, you cannot go straight to the Department of Biosafety. You must go through this Institutional Biosafety Committee and I will tell you why later on. So once the department receives your notification, we will check for completeness. We will check that you know, everything is in um, place. Basically, we do the initial assessment of your activity, right? And if everything is there, we, we, we can issue a letter of acknowledgement, which means it's a simple letter from the DG, which says, okay, we have uh, basically done the preliminary assessment and everything is in place. You may start your activity. So the researcher, once the researcher obtains that letter of acknowledgement, they can immediately start their um, activity. And while they are doing the activity on our side, right, we have, uh, we will continue the assessment, GMAT will continue the assessment, and if need be, uh, any relevant government agencies, okay. Once GMAT has assessed it, then GMAT will bring the assessment to the NBB, and the NBB will decide whether to approve the uh, activity at the end of the day. If the NDB approves it, then they will issue an approval uh, letter, a certificate of approval, as you call it. But the whole time, you know, the, the applicant is still conducting the activity. So see, there's a, there's a lot of misconception here. Something that, oh, okay, I cannot start my activity until I get an approval from the NDB. Now for, co for continuous for notification process, once you receive the letter of acknowledgement from the Department of Biosafety, you can start it already while waiting for your certificate of approval from the board, okay? But that is different with an approval process. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that the notification process takes 90 days, meaning from the day that we receive your notification that we've determined that everything is complete and we have issued the acknowledgement letter and all that, 90 days from then until you receive the certificate of approval from the board. Now for an approval process, that was a notification process. Yeah? The approval process takes much longer. It is 180 days and you cannot start your activity until you receive the certificate of approval from the board. And 
Why is this? Why is it different from the notification? Simply because notification, again, is for continuous activity, right? So we know continuous, if anything happens, it's still within a contained environment. So it can be controlled as opposed to something that's in a, a released environment because approval process, it applies to release activities. Once something is out there, out there in the environment, in the field, if anything were to go wrong, right, it'd be very hard to recall it or um, to take uh, em emergency um, measures. So the reason why an approval process takes 180 days and why the researcher cannot start until you get an approval from the board is simply because, you know, a release activity is the, the impact of a release activity is much more uh, severe if anything were to go wrong as compared to a contained use activity. So the applicant, again, if it's an R&D field trial, you go through your IBC, the IBC will submit it to the department. And then if the department finds it complete, we will still process it. So we don't issue any acknowledgement here. Okay. So you will, you as the researcher will still have to hold on. Now on the department side, we will forward it to the GMAC for that assessment, uh, forward it to any relevant government agencies. For example, uh, if you are doing work again, field trial, GM plan, that would be a DOA. Um, we have a, a list of agencies, okay, relevant government agencies. And then here we have public consultation. Why? Because under the act for uh, release activities, okay, approval, you must have public consultation. You must consult the public on release activities. So how public consultation, um, just a little bit of information, how we do public consultation is the applicant will have to make um, an announcement through newspapers for major the major languages, which is uh, Bahasa, English, uh, Mandarin and Tamil newspapers. Okay. Um, the, in uh, two weeks, for, uh, for, for two weeks, meaning let's say the first announcement in the newspaper is on the 1st, of October, and then the second announcement would be on the 14th of October. And we give the public a month from the 14th until the 30th, 30th to come back with any, if they have any uh, comments or queries regarding the um, approval of the GMO. And we will try our best to uh, respond to the public's queries. Okay? Then once all that is done, when public consultation is done, when we have gotten um, feedback from the government agency, we forward this to the National Biosafety Board, okay, for, for them to make their uh, decision, whether they approve of the, um, the application or whether there's anything else that they should take into consideration. So, if it's an RNE for field trial, once you get an approval from the National Biosafety Board, then only you may start your field trial. Okay. Same thing goes for approval process for release of LMO and products of LMO. They go through the same, the same process as well. So in summary, for our regulatory processes, notification okay, is for contained use. Approval is for release activity. Notification only takes 90 days, where else an approval takes 180 days. Another thing I should um, highlight, highlight again here is for notification, yes, you, it's sufficient. The researcher can start your activity once you obtain an acknowledgement receipt from the department. Where else for approval, you cannot start your activity because you need the final certificate of approval from the board. So this is, in a way, another way of showing that we do not want to hinder research. In fact, this is how we, we want to um, help facilitate your uh, researchers' research. Because we know, you know, researchers, you as a researcher, you have so many things to think about. Maybe your, your, your grant, maybe your, your, your milestone, your timeline. So that's why we said, okay, um, 
to wait for it to go to uh, perhaps we do not need to wait for it to go to the board. You know, yes, the board will make the de decision at the end of the day uh, whether to approve it or not, but it will be sufficient with our preliminary um, assessment to say that, okay, the researcher can start conducting this activity before uh, getting the final certificate of approval. Now, for an uh, uh, approval, okay, that is actually a fee involved. So for notification, there is no fee. That's another, another way of showing researchers, look, we don't want to burden you. We don't want to place a fee. Well, currently there's no fee. Has, there hasn't been a fee for 10, 10 years. I, I cannot say about the future, but so, you know, researchers don't have to worry about, oh, because we know sometimes one researcher, you would have like 10 research ongoing. So we don't place a, that's why we haven't been placing a fee for, for notification. But for approval, there's just a small minimal fee, as you can see. So for R&D in field experiment, you know, depending on the size of the hectare, that's the fee. 5,000 is for other release activities, as in um, this is mostly for those uh, technology developers who are seeking approval for their products for the purpose of food feed and processing. Okay. Now, how does the NBB make a decision on whether to approve uh, an application or not? So they look at about three, three main things they look at. First, they look at the assessment done by GMAC, okay? the scientific assessment. GMAC's assessment is purely scientific. And then if it's a, a release activity, then they'll look at the public input. So uh, whatever the public thinks or feels, you know, the feedback that we receive from the public, okay, we will forward that to the NBB so they know, you know they, they are aware of the, the, the public's opinion. So we do not hide anything. In fact, we are very uh, transparent. So if that's a part, uh, let's say an individual organization who says, you know, I do not agree with this GMO to be released, or I have concerns, so on we forward that directly to the board. So the board is aware that, you know, okay, so and so they have a concern on this GMO or regarding the release of this GMO. And sometimes the board will ask us to take actions to maybe um, alleviate the concerns of the public. Uh, if you recall, I don't know whether some of you were, back then during the uh, early years of the Biosafety Act, when there was a release activity for uh, GM mosquitoes. Okay, we got a lot of public feedback from that, you know, they were worried and this, that, and that's why from, from that public input, uh, we told the applicant, okay, okay, this are what the public is worried about. So you have to have maybe a town hall meeting with the area that you plan to release those mosquitoes. Uh, you have to, you know, address these, uh, these concerns, this feedback. Uh, and then we, we make it public, okay, these are, these are your concerns. This is our, uh, our feedback to your concern. No, we, we, inf we let the public know. Next, um, and this is on a need be basis, the NDB can also take into consideration any social economic um, policies and whatnot, if, if there are any. So for example, maybe, uh, this one doesn't come up very often because we currently we have no actually um, you know commercial planting of GM crops but well if one day we do I, we foresee that you know this this may may, may come into uh, place okay if, for example let's say we want to plant a GM crop in this area you have to take into consideration maybe it's next to a uh, small small uh, farmers land and something like that whether it would disrupt you know the economics of the uh, of, of this farmer the livelihood or, or something like that so that's an example of uh, social economic consideration now as with any act okay non-compliance to get an approval from the national biosafety board when you're conducting a release activity or contain use can result in a penalty so don't think okay i'm a researcher I haven't gotten the NBB's approval yet, or I haven't gotten uh, an acknowledgement receipt, but I will just continue quietly conducting my work in my lab. So that actually can result in a, a penalty. So you, you can see this is the, 
the amount of the penalty. Hence why we have the, the regulation for uh, compounding. Okay? Now, we have actually under the Act, uh, exemption clause where the minister can, okay, upon recommendation of the NBB, exempt, oh goodness, so sorry about that, can exempt um, any or all provisions of this Act. Okay? So currently what we have exempted is products of LMOs that are non-viable. And the two products that are non-viable uh, that we've uh, identified are, for example, GM wood and GM cotton. Okay? Those are exempted. Uh, what we mean by GM cotton is in the GM cotton uh, products, not, not the, the, the raw cotton, but products. So if your shirt is made from uh, GM cotton or if your fabric is made of GM cotton, your furniture is made of GM wood, those are exempted. Because we know that they're non-viable, they can't propagate anyway. They 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 place uh, no no risk to the environment or to human health animals. So that's exempted. Okay, and LMO, LMOs which have been approved for food, feed, and processing, okay, are exempted from subsequent use for food, feed, processing. So, for example, if I am importer and I'm importing this GM coin, okay, and I've gotten an approval to import this GM coin to make uh, biscuits and whatnot for food, feed and processing. And then suddenly, uh, person B wants to import the same GM coin for uh, same reasons, food, feed and processing. Person B does not have to apply for an approval from the board anymore because I've already uh, received the approval. So then anyone else after me can actually just import that LMO, okay, that it has to be that same LMO for the uh, same reason, which is for FFP. So in other words, we're trying to make it easier as well for, um, for, for the uh, importers. And then notification for export. So if I am a researcher, I've got my LMO, I want to import, uh, export it sorry, to a university overseas. So I, I have to inform, notify the Department of Biosafety. Okay, I am uh, exporting it to this, this university for them to, to do the testing. And then perhaps three months down the line, I'm going to continuously be doing that, continuously be sending that same LMO to the same university for the same reason, to keep on testing it. Uh, that, that is also uh, an exempted. So only for the first time, you need to notify the, uh, uh, the, the department of your export. And then after that, you do not need to notify us anymore. We also have uh, okay, a schedule under our regulation Okay, and in the schedule, there's a table with techniques, activities, and host vector systems. It's a list of techniques, activities, and host vector systems. It's in fact too long for me to put here. Okay, which are exempted from the act. So if you are, uh, let's say, using one of the host vector systems or conducting one of the activities that's in that in that list, okay, you do not have to um, get an approval from the National Biosafety Board. So this list of exemption, it will be revised from time to time. Okay, when the current, I can think of a few, if I'm not mistaken, this list, it's while we were um, building this list, okay, initially, we, we uh, consulted researchers and lecturers, okay, uh, what are the modern biotech activities, which, you know, you have proven, um, has been proven safe at that time. Because you have to remember this is way back in, probably before uh, 2000, 2010, or ad activities that you uh, regularly conduct that you think uh, can be exempted from the act. So we have, for example, I think work with uh, C. elegans, uh, Drosophila, for example. So those are some of the uh, organisms that are exempted under the, the, the act. But you have to check actually the, the list. Okay? And okay, this part is important. The Biosafety Act actually exempts from uh, LMOs that are um, for pharmaceutical purposes. Meaning, okay, let's say I am working on an LMO and I want to create a vaccine. Because we know uh, that is probably the uh, uh, hot, hot, hot thing right now. So, 
Of course, while working with the LMO, the R&D part of that, we regulate that because you're doing contained use. Yeah? So we regulate the contained use of uh, that LMO. But let's say I've, I've done my R&D. So now I'm in the um, production part of it. Okay, I want to produce it and commercialize it for the purpose of pharmaceuticals. We do not um, regulate that. And the reason why is because you know that pharmaceuticals are very well regulated. We have international treaties and whatnot that regulate pharmaceuticals. So that's why it's exempted from the act. And then we have a labeling provision, uh, provision under the act. I won't go in details. Yep. Just uh, sufficient to know that labeling for GMO for food, human food purposes, that actually falls under the, um, the Ministry of Health because they have a food regulation Okay, and, and the competent authority for that is the Food Safety and Quali Quality Division of MOH. So what we regulate is the raw material, you know, GM corn, GM soya that's coming in. And once it's corn and soya is used for making uh, food and all that, food items, that falls under the MOH. Okay. Enforcement of our act, we have a collaborative enforcement. So we can actually use uh, Marquis Quarantine Inspection Services. Uh, we use the custom, support people, you know, everyone to, uh, to help us in enforcing the act. We have sampling activities where we sample, uh, we take samples from the ports, from the borders, from airports, and then we actually test the samples to detect whether they're GM or not. And then we work together with some labs to, to do this uh, GMO detection. Okay, so now, that's the act done. So you as a researcher, how can you comply with the act? Okay, these are the important points that you need to know. Number one, first and foremost, again, is if you are doing modern biotech work, you need an approval from the National Biosafety Board. That's number one on the list for researchers. Now, prior, how to get the, uh, the approval or how to do the, uh, you know, the whole application process, this is where your IBC comes in. Okay, researchers, you must understand how important your IBC, your Institutional Biosafety Committee is. Okay? What is an IBC? I, I hope by now the researchers, there are no researchers who are still unaware, who still don't know what an IBC is. But anyway, an IBC, okay, under our uh, biosafety regulation, it actually says that all institutes that conduct modern biosafety activity, they must establish an IBC. So it's in the regulations. Okay. So if you are an institution that conducts modern biotech activity, but you do not establish an IBC, then actually that is um, going against the, 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 the regulations. So an IBC is an expert committee of an institution whose main job is to monitor and ensure that their institution complies with the Biosafety Act if their researchers are conducting modern biotechnology activity. Now, we made it easy for the institution to establish an IBC. All we need, a minimum composition of IBC is just two. You need to have the chair, you need to have the BSO. The IBC has many responsibilities. Okay? The main responsibilities would be to monitor activities relating to modern biotechnology, to provide guidance for the safe use of modern biotechnology, to determine the BSL level of the facilities, and to establish and monitor policies and procedures. So you as a researcher, again, okay, if you need any help regarding your modern biotechnology activity, you please approach your IBC because your IBC is the one who is um, responsible for monitoring modern biotechnology activities and they're responsible for uh, guiding you in conducting your activities. So this is just a, um, a list of the uh, responsibilities. So, for example, how, how can an IBC guide you? Let's say you are doing modern biotechnology activity and you need um, to, to, to develop a, an SOP, standard operating procedures, on how to or work in the lab. This is why it's best for IBCs to come up with, most IBCs have already come up with a biosafety manual, a general biosafety manual. Okay? It could be a general biosafety manual. And this manual, um, you know, researchers can use it as a baseline okay, and adapt this manual okay, 
for their activity. So they use this as a template, a baseline, and they have to adapt it and make it more uh, specific to their research activity. If you have um, any, uh, another important thing is, as a researcher, when you are working in your lab, okay, you need to refer to your IBC because your IBC is the one responsible for setting or determining the containment level of the lab, the premises that you are using for activity. So you, you can't just say, oh, okay, I'm doing this activity. I will call this premise that I'm using a BSL2. No, it is the IBC's uh, responsibility okay, to actually uh, review, to, 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 to conduct an assessment of the lab and, and, and determine the level of uh, BSL level of the lab. So that's why I say as a researcher, you must know the importance, the, the role your IBC plays. Okay, Always please refer to your IBC prior to conducting a modern biotechnology activity and discuss with your IBC because if you remember the, the chart that I showed you before, before sending an application to the biosafety board, uh, to the Department of Biosafety, it has to go through your IBC. Your IBC has to do the initial assessment and if they agree to it, then only they will forward the application to our department. Okay. Now, when, before you conduct an activity, you need to conduct a risk assessment of your activity. And from that risk assessment, you need to develop your risk management strategies. Okay? So in other words, we are saying you can do whatever you want. That, that is up to you. It's fine. Just before you conduct or before an activity, just make sure that you are aware of any possible risks that may arise from your activity. Now, under the Biosafety Act also, conducting a risk assessment and providing a risk assessment, risk management and ERP, when you uh, submit an, a notification application to us, okay, these are mandatory things that you must conduct. So this is a sample of a risk assessment matrix. Okay? After so many years, I think the first few initial um, initial uh, application forms, you know, we led it up to the researchers, how they want to conduct the risk, uh, risk assessment. And then we decided, you know, let's give them a bit of guidance. So we, we made a risk assessment matrix in hopes to, you know, facilitate, to make it easier on researchers. Because at that time, researchers were like, okay, so how do I do risk assessment? How, uh, what should I say? What should I look at? So this is our way of helping you as, as a researcher. So we've uh, provided a risk assessment matrix in our in our in the form. Is these are the bare minimum. This is what these are the important things that you uh, can look at when assessing your activity. So uh, basically, they've decided the important things are to look at the signs of the genetic modification. And for example, what are the organisms that you're working with? What are the genes that you are working with? What, where did you get the genes, the source of, of, of the gene? Is it from, um, you know, uh, is the genes virulent, not virulent, um, or which organism it come from? And then the admin policy, do you have policies in place when working with, uh, with, with this, for example, uh, with this virus? And then containment integrity, do you have the correct premises? Are you using the correct premises when conducting your activity? Um, and any special risk or unique to your notification. So once you as a researcher have conducted your uh, risk assessment, okay, so I've, I've done all this, I've conducted my risk assessment, I must make sure that the premise that I use matches with the assessment that I have done. So if, for example, if I'm working with a virus uh, a organism that probably is a uh, infectious and whatnot, I have to make sure that the premise I use, it can be a BSL-1, it has to be a, at least a, a BSL-2, for example, or if it if it can um, uh, what aerosolize or something, whether I have a, whether the premise that I'm working in, whether it has the facility that I need to use, for example, a biosafety cabinet or whatnot. So all this will be decided after you've conducted a risk assessment, okay? So, your risk assessment and of course the IBC at the end of the day will determine what kind of containment level uh, you need to conduct your activity. 
That's why we say the IBC is important. The IBC has to do the initial assessment. So I as a researcher, for example, have done my risk assessment and I forward it to my IBC and say, okay, I've done the risk assessment. These are the risks. Okay? Mm. Uh, these are my management strategies. Uh, do you think it is uh, all right for me to proceed? Or is there anything that I, I, I'm missing from this uh, risk assessment and missing out in how to manage this and all that? This is where the IBC comes into place. Okay? Now, once the IBC has done uh, their vetting or their assessment of a researcher's uh, application and you forwarded it to the Department of Biosafety, and let's say it's already gone to the board, at the end of the day, the board is the one who, in their, uh, let's say, when they, when they decide to give an approval, it's up to the board also, if need be, to make any additional terms and conditions if they see fit. Okay? So for example, if suddenly the board says, okay, um, yes, you have done your assessment. Um, you say you should use a, a BSL-1 for this activity and your IBC agrees, but uh, we as the board, after you know taking this into consideration and all that, we say that we you need a minimum level of BSL-2 to do this activity. So that is the board's uh, terms and condition. Okay, you can carry this activity out, but it has to be in a BSL-2, for example, okay? So you must um, follow the terms and conditions that is uh, that the bot has subjected you to, and you must take the measures. And for example, the bot say, okay, you need to have additional emergency response plan measures and all that. So you have to take the necessary um, action. So basically, the risk assessment process is a three-tier process. The applicant does a risk assessment, then the IB IBC reviews the assessment and endorses it, and then you have GMAC doing additional assessment and you have NDB. So you can see how, how when we say that, you know, it gives uh, investors an added sense of like uh, confidence in your, your research because they know, okay, it's not easy to get an approval from the uh, biosafety board. Not easy in the sense that, you know, you have to make sure you've, you've done your, your assessment properly and all that. So they know they've got faith, you know, and confidence in you as a researcher. Okay. And then we also have compliance to terms and conditions. We've got compliance visit, whereby let's say you received the approval and then uh, later on, maybe the Department of Biosafety or GMAT might come to your lab premises uh, to see whether you've complied with what uh, the board has set for you, the terms and conditions. Or for example, the reason why the board gave you this approval is because you said you are taking uh, these precautionary measures. You said that you are conducting your work in a biosafety cabinet and all that. And then if, uh, and because of that, let's say, yes, we, the board says, because of that, okay, it is safe. You have taken our uh, necessary precautions. But then when we come to the compliance, the term condition visit, and we see, no, you're not actually using the, the biosafety cabinet as you stated in your uh, risk assessment of that, then that would be a, a non-compliance. And um, well, you know, so, Number four, researchers need to know what information to submit and how to do it. First things first, make sure that you submit the correct form, depending on the type of activity that you are conducting. So we have a lot of different types of uh, approval forms, as you can see, okay, whether you're doing an R&D for field experiment, or whether it is other than field experiment, okay, if you're doing field experiment, whether the the field experiment is for an LMO that's a higher plant, okay, or whether it's LMO other than a higher plant. So in other words, whether your field experiment is a GM animal, for example, then that would be form B. If you're doing an uh, LMO plant, that would be form A. So these are just examples of form. And notification is uh, much more easy, straightforward. So whether you're doing contained use or whether you're exporting it. So these are the two things that uh, requires a notification form to have form E and form F. Now, uh, let's assume you are a researcher doing a continuous activity, okay? So what is the type of information that is needed for continuous? As you can see, um, you have to make sure that your SOPs are in place. You have a SOP for a disposal of animals, okay? Uh, if you are transporting or transferring the LMO, let's say you have a few different premises you're working at, from this lab at this faculty to another faculty's lab, or perhaps from your institution and then you're transporting it to another institution 
uh, to use the lab. Okay, you must have uh, an SOP on how you plan to transport it. In fact, actually, most of these SOPs are nothing new. Even non-GM work, I think like uh, most researchers have to agree, even if you're doing non-GM work, you would have to have an SOP in place, right, for disposal of your of um, your, your waste. Uh, transporting, how do you transport your microorganisms and all that. So this is actually just a, a it's similar to, to that. So that maybe if you're doing an LMO, just an added uh, precaution based on your LMO. So that's why we say that, you know, the Biosafety Act does not hinder uh, research. If anything, it just enhances good laboratory practices, which by right should have already been there. You should already have that good laboratory practices, practices in place. Okay. So anyway, for contained use, these are the type of information. And for field trial, you have uh, uh, other... The, the types of information that is required is different because obviously like for field trial, we would like to know where the location, what is surrounding uh, the, the trial area, the size of your trial, etc. cetera. Okay. So when you submit the information, another thing is also submitting the information. When you submit it, please make sure that it is in a proper, uh, a proper form. So I'm in proper format. For example, when you're submitting, we require okay information on your uh, uh, personnel. So make sure you list out the personnel that are involved in this activity okay? and whether they are uh, competent to conduct the activity. For example, if you're doing work on an animal, you have to ensure that your personnel has been trained in handling animals. You can't just have uh, someone who has no experience coming to handle animals. Okay? And then the description of your activity, your project. Make sure you write a clear description so that we are assessing it. You know, we understand what you are doing. We understand, uh, okay, what is the LMO that you are uh, you are dealing with, or where does the GM work come in? Because we've had project descriptions that are so vague, extremely vague that we 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 have no idea what what you are doing. I mean, we understand that researchers sometimes they're like very secretive. You know, secretive. They scared. Oh, I don't want you to know what I'm doing and all that. Okay, first things first. Uh, don't worry. It. Uh, we do not leak any information out because we are bound by the uh, Official Secrets Act and all that. And secondly, uh, you know, being too vague would not help you as a researcher because we need to do our assessment as well. GMAT needs to do assessment. So if it's extremely vague and we look at the, uh, the your application and we have no idea what you're doing, that's not good for you. In fact, if anything, that will actually take longer for you as a researcher to obtain an approval from the board because then we have to keep on going back to you asking for more information, asking you to clarify this, come and meet us to discuss this. So to avoid all that, okay, it's best to be uh, transparent and, and, and open and uh, you know, describe to us as, as clearly as possible, okay, this is the project that I'm doing, where does the GM work come into place, this is what I'm doing. Okay? You have to give us information on the LMO, what is the donor organism, what is the parent, organ, what is the gene of interest, what is the function of the gene that you're working with. And what are your plans, right? Okay. And then, of course, your risk assessment, management, your ERP plans, and your SOPs. Now, um, standard operating procedures, it sounds so simple. SOP, okay. We've had, I mean, previously, now I would think that researchers are, are um, um, more experienced. We've previously had one-liner SOPs, like, okay, what is your uh, plans? SOP for disposal. Oh, to autoclave it and then... Uh, just uh, throw it via the, let's say, service provider. That's it, one liner. No, as it says, it's a standard operating procedure. So it has to be a proper document. So this is what we mean by submitting proper documents to, to the department. So a proper SOP document with information such as when was this, um, like most proper documents, you have to have information of when was this created, who created it, who approved of it, of it if it was revised, when was it revised, state of revision, okay? And then what is this SOP used for? Okay, for example, SOP for waste disposal to be uh, referred or used in lab, lab one. It has to be an activity, it has to be specific to activity. So if your IBC has prepared you a biosafety manual, that is, that's very good because that biosafety manual is a general manual for all researchers to refer to. But you as a researcher should adapt that general manual and tailor it to your activity. So then 
you refer to that and maybe you revise it because we know like we still get SOPs that say things like oh uh, dispose uh what um this dispose i using either or uh, th this or this or disinfect this disinfect using either method a or method b you know that probably came from the biosafety manual because biosafety manual again i says general but your activity you decide how do you want to dispose it how do you want to disinfect it do you want to use this method what are you using for disinfection uh what are you using for disposal so those kind of things it has to be specifically uh, stated in your sop so this is what we mean by a proper documentation okay and then the premises information of your premises which premises you are using um whether this premises has been previously assessed by your ibc and if it has been assessed do you have the uh, inspection report if this this will help greatly because we know then the ibc has inspected that premises and then we have your IBC's assessment, where the IBC actually writes an assessment at the end of the day. Yes, we have assessed uh, this activity. Uh, we've taken into consideration this, 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 this. Um, and we feel that it is okay, safe for the researcher to, to conduct this activity. So in other words, your IBC's endorsement of your activity. So, and any additional information. By additional information, perhaps some researchers like to, like to send us maybe a reference documents and all that okay that's fine so what to submit whether you're doing a notification or approval okay your original form we want to see the or we want the original form okay and then six copies of the form it has to be identical copies well by identical meaning the original form which has already been for example stamped signed by the ibc chair and all that uh, we want copies of that okay and also a soft copy of the form. So the soft copy should be a copy of uh, that original form, not we've received so many soft copies that are actually draft versions or they have not been uh, signed or by the chair, believe it or not. So, you know, these are small things, but sometimes because of these small things, you know, if you overlook it, it may actually hinder the process of uh, pr the processing of your uh, application. Okay. then supporting documents and then your IBC assessment report. Now, if you are applying for an approval again for a release activity, there is a payment that you need to submit as well. So please remember that the information that you submit must be true. So it's an offense to submit any misleading information. We encourage you to provide supporting documents for, for your statements. For example, if you're quoting something, a risk matrix and you say, oh, uh, so and uh, uh, referring to this 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 you know there is no uh this this is a uh, safe for use and blah blah maybe if you have a, a reference for that something you can provide the supporting documents yeah and then during our assessment we may request additional information for from from you okay and if we request additional information and you delay in submitting this information we may uh withdraw the acknowledgement why because for example we've already given you sort of the freedom like okay you've applied to us and we said okay uh here this is your acknowledgement receipt you go ahead and and conduct your activity while we still continue processing it uh and sending it to gmail and the board but then along the way of processing and then suddenly we find okay this if information is not sufficient or maybe gmail has an inquiry like oh okay i need more information on on this organism that they're working with and whatnot and we ask you to to you know Finish us with the information and you take your own, own time just because you're like thinking, okay, I am already conducting the activity, never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll just ignore the department first and continue conducting. When we've already given you the acknowledgement receipt to conduct the activity, we may actually uh, retract the or withdraw the acknowledgement receipt, saying, okay, we're withdrawing the acknowledgement receipt, so you need to stop the activity because it took you too long. For example, to provide us this information, we are withdrawing the acknowledgement. Of course, if we withdraw the acknowledgement, uh, if we do do that, you are uh, you you may submit a fresh uh, notification for that activity. But it's a, it's a for you as a researcher, you know, it's such a waste because you have to start all over again just to submit the the notification. So we also in the act, okay, we we. 
let you claim for CBI confidential business information, all right? But of course, there are criteria that you have to meet in order to be able to claim for the CBI, okay? And please, there are some things which you definitely cannot uh, claim as CBI, which is the name and address of the applicant, USAPI, the description of the LMO. You, you can't claim that CBI. Like I mentioned, if you can, if, if that CBI, how are we going to assess, you know, your application okay? and your risk management, your risk assessment, your risk management, you, you can't claim all that as a CBI. Okay. As a researcher, okay, there are various available uh, biosafety resources out there. We would, uh, we've also pro provided uh, some resources, which we hope, you know, that researchers can refer to these resources, these guidelines that we've, um, we've come up with, such as guidelines for confined field trial. We've got guidelines for continuous activities of LMOs. Okay? So researchers can re refer uh, to those guidelines. And then for additional reading material, we have our publications and all that. So we have our official biosafety website whereby you can find all these guidelines and you can download these guidelines for free from our biosafety website, www.biosafety.gov.my. So kindly uh, visit the website, not just guidelines, you can actually obtain all the forms, the application forms um, from the website. Yeah. In fact, the techniques which I mentioned that uh, exempted techniques, you can also uh, look at the website because you can download the list of exempted techniques. There, we have uh, the exemption list for continuous ex activities, exemption by minister, you can download the act, download the regulations to refer to it. Okay? Let's say you're, after looking through the list, you find out that your activity is exempted. You know, your modern biotechnology activity is exempted. So what do you do? You don't just silently conduct it okay, in your research institution. What you should still do as a researcher is approach your IBC. Okay? First, uh, you can ask your IBC to double check. Is my activity exempted or isn't it? So IBC, after checking, if IBC says, oh, sorry, no, it's not exempted. Okay, fine. Then you go through the application process. But if it is exempted, what, what you need to do is you work closely with your IBC. Let your IBC be in the know that, okay, you are conducting uh, this GM work, which is exempted, but the IBC has to keep tabs on it. Okay, IBC has to monitor uh, the activity and report it in the yearly IBC annual report. So this is an, at least an, uh, in this report, there is a column where, you know, exempted activities that are being conducted in the, in the institution. So then the IBC will listen. This is for, actually, we're trying to help institutions as well. So that you as an institution, I mean, so that the institution itself is aware of what is being conducted in the institution. Because there are many instances where they're not aware of, oh, so this researcher is doing this, this researcher is doing that. You know, they can't keep tabs. So here we are trying to help the institution to keep tabs on what is going on, what kind of research is being conducted. We're also trying to help the researchers in ensuring that you know your research is being conducted uh, properly and uh, carefully uh, compliant to the act. Okay? And let's say for IBCs, uh, if you are still unsure, we always welcome IBCs to come and um, uh, contact the department. Our email address is always free. Our phone lines always free. You know, IBCs can always call us if they have any inquiries about any activities. Okay. So, in summary, these are the if anything. After I've been talking for an hour or so, the the take back points would be now first and foremost, any modern biotechnology acti activity, please get an approval from the NDB first before conducting your activity. Number two, as a researcher, please be aware of your IBC, okay? the role of your IBC. Do not hesitate in um, approaching your IBC for, for, for help. And IBCs also, you play an important role. You know, you have to assist your researchers. Number three, you must always conduct a risk assessment, uh, risk management, and have an emergency response plan 
for your activities. You can do what you want. It's fine. But make sure that you've assessed the risk okay, and you, you know how to manage the risk as well as has, have an emergency response plan if anything goes wrong. Make sure when you submit your information okay, to help us process your, your application faster, make sure you know how to submit the information and what kind of information is being submitted. That's important. And also refer to any available biosafety resources. Okay. And uh, perhaps uh, before submitting an application to us, you can check whether your activity is a contained use activity. Um, we've had instances where, uh, th this is where the IBC plays their part. If it is an exempted activity, you can inform your researcher. No, it's okay. We, you do not have to get the uh, NBB's approval. And then we stop it at that. If the IBC themselves are unsure whether it's exempted, they can always consult our department. Uh, there have been instances a few times when an exempted activity has actually gone to our department, like while we are assessing it, and then we look at it and we're like, eh, this should be exempted. This is uh, so and so. We inform the IBC. In fact, we, we stop the um, processing. If we catch it earlier, we stop the processing and then be like, okay, uh, it's an exempted activity, so we won't be issuing a acknowledgement receipt. You know, you can just go through IBC. So, at the end of the day, so we we are the regulators. We, we do not want to hinder okay, research. Okay, we want to help enable research. So researchers have to to realize that that you know, regulators, researchers, we need to work together to make sure that the the environment that we are creating, right, for modern biotechnology, it's, we, we enable modern biotechnology, but at the same time, we have to ensure, it's our responsibility as individuals to ensure that while conducting our activity, that the human, plant, animal health, biodiversity environment, okay, is conserved as well. Your end goal is not just to get, okay, the objective of your research, fine. It should be, you know, all encompassing. To, that you get have a successful research, uh, the outcome of this is successful, but at the same time, you know, to ensure that while doing the research, everything else is safe. Because we shouldn't take safety lightly, as, uh, as, you, are well, as you are aware. Hence the Biosafety Biosecurity Week, right? So with that, um, thank you very much for listening. And um, I'll return the floor to the moderator, Dr. Maha. Thank you, Ms. Aza. Thank you so much for the very comprehensive, very detailed um, presentation on Malaysian Biosafety Act and also regulations. And you also went into um, the labeling uh, law as well, which is not under your ministry. So yes. that was really very useful. So um, now I would like to open the session for discussion, question, questions, comments, or even sharing your own experience. I did say in the chat box that please Put your comments or questions in the chat box. So please do so if you have anything. So Dr. Prabha says, thank you very much for your in informative, instructive talk with clear technical regulatory uh, uh, contents. Yes, uh, very good job done by Ms. Azar. Any other, any questions from uh, the participants, those who are involved in agri-biotechnology research, or even if you're from the industry or you intend to do, Please, uh, this is your opportunity. Um, I think they can also unmute themselves, right? If they want uh, to speak, can they? Can uh, Can someone tell me, Dr. Subash? Yes, or... yes, yes, they can unmute, yeah. They could, okay. So you could also unmute yourself and ask your question directly. Unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and also let us look at your face. Um, so it becomes really, a, you know, in spite of all the limitations, we are able to have a face-to-face -face contact. Thank you, Dr. Maha. And Prof. Thank Ravi, you. yes. Yeah, this is Prof. Ravi. I've been watching this. It's very nice uh, presentation on biosafety. It's very relevant and uh, it's, uh, we have to comply to the Biosafety and Biosecurity Act. And Dr. Shubhas has been doing it for a long time and um, Really, we learned a lot. I think a lot of researchers are there. They're actually, some of them are beginning and some of them are doing some work. Uh, possibly, we can uh, uh, 
uh, we can discuss about uh, maybe some examples. Uh, let's say, uh, uh, maybe I, I'm just throwing out a, uh, one hypothetical work. Most of the undergraduate and postgraduate student might be doing it. Let's say they have an E. coli they transform with the plasmid. Uh, is it exempted or it is, uh, we have to follow the... Okay, so uh, again, there is the, uh, you would have to refer to the exemption list because yeah. um, I, I, I haven't memorized it at the top of my head, but I know that uh, certain E. coli, I think it's like E. coli K or so, and then there's also, um, depending on the, the, the host vector that you're using or whether it's a conjugative, non-conjugative vector and all that. Uh, so you just refer to the table and then you will see whether it is uh, exempted or, or, or not. But of course, if you're unsure, again, we are very happy to, to take uh, questions. We do get from time to time uh, the IBC emailing us on behalf of the researcher or maybe a researcher directly emailing you know, with the questions. And then sometimes we'll ask for more information like, okay, uh, what are you working with? Uh, give us a bit of a background on what kind of E. coli, for example, what kind of uh, uh, organism and all that. And then we will get back whether it's an exempted activity or not. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is where uh, where it um, the uh, the ministry and also the department facilitates research where you don't have to put in all your documents and then wait whether it's exempted, what is it, and where is it notification or is it approval. So you can just email and before uh, putting your paperwork together. Uh, Dr. Arunachalam here, I've got a question. He says, uh, very good information. May I know the exempted list of organisms for research work or any link to this information? Um, Azam, maybe you can okay. share a link in the chat. Where, oh, yeah, yeah, a list chat. of all. Yeah, if, you, if it's possible or later, you can also give it to, I think, later to uh, Dr. Subash to be shared with the participants. Yeah, I forgot to show the slide where um, our website is www.biosafety.gov.my. Let me just type the www.biosafety. I am, I am, okay, yes, I'm typing it www.biosafety.my. Yes, yeah, it is there, my. right? Mm. Yes, it is there. So uh, our publications all are there. If you can't find what you are looking for, because sometimes I understand maybe uh, the website may not be so user friendly for some people, you can always also. E email us. Uh, our email is dob at biosafety.gov.my also, right? So if you have any inquiries as well, you can send your inquiries to that email address. Okay. Thank you very much. And Dr. Gunalan has got a question. May I know what uh, the guidelines for EM, effective microbes, huh? if any, as there are many times in preparation use for livestock sector? I think it's only uh, applicable if they're G, uh, GM, but I'm going to let um, no, that, that is true because if it's just, um, again, our guidelines are, mo are for uh, living modified organisms, GM organisms. So um, if it's non-GM, uh, we don't have guidelines for, for, for that. And uh, I suppose for this, probably it would be Maybe the Ministry of Health, you can, you can chat with, with them probably for microbes. Yeah. For livestock. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Murgaya has got a question. Just want to know about laboratory animals biosecurity. Do you also cover this aspect? Uh, well, if they are, let's say, GM animals that you're working with, and then, then we will look at, at that aspect because, for example, we've had like GM work with probably the losing GM mice and whatnot. So in terms of, uh, I, I, I have, for example, some of the things that maybe uh, GM, the bot will look at if you're working with the GM animal. It's almost the same as a non-GM, but they just want to make sure that maybe, maybe you know, the GM animal is kept se uh, separate from the non-GM, or at least make sure that it is uh, contained uh, uh, properly or whatnot. So these are just a few uh, examples lah, of if you're working yeah. with GM yeah. animals. So basically, I think uh, uh, Ms. Azad actually, she did uh, clearly say that anything to do with LMOs, GMOs. So if your animals are not, like say COVID, COVID has got biosecurity issues. Yes. But then it, uh, Nipah virus, last time, you know, our pigs in Negri Sembilan, mm -hmm. it started in Negri Sembilan. It, it is biosecurity issues, but it's not GMO. So yeah, that is not, not covered by 
environment, but it's covered under veterinary science and uh, MOH, if I'm mistaken, right? Mm, um, yes. Can I just uh, yeah. say that? Sure. Uh, so our, we are looking at biosafety of uh, GMOs. Of course, uh, if, if you recall, like for example, the risk matrix that, that I showed when you're doing a risk assessment of your GM work, one of the components would be your, your containment facility. So this is almost like a biosecurity in the sense that, okay, we want to make sure that the facility, the premises you are using, maybe it's a secure premise where not anyone can just come in and out of the premises that you're using, that it's uh, access, uh, is only for uh, authorized personnel and not all that. So that in a way is somewhat of a, a biosecurity uh, as well. But that's as much as we go into uh, biosecurity. Our main concern is actually the, the G GM safety. Yes. yes. Yeah. Any other questions from the participants? I have a question, um, Azam. So you mentioned labeling, and I know it goes under Ministry of Health. And uh, the food, our Food uh, Safety Act was amended 2008 and uh, mm -hmm. 2010. And um, so what is the status now? Because we still don't see it being implemented. <laughs> Uh, what's the status? Because I was in the consultation and I did tell the ministry that, look, this is going to be very difficult. Come up with something that is implementable, practical, but even they started with zero um, threshold in the beginning and we all said it's not going to be practical. So even with 3% threshold, we are not implementing it. So what is the status? Well, unfortunately, I am uh, I am not in the place to say the status because okay. that is under the... Yeah. Uh, but if anyone is interested in maybe just looking at the uh, guidelines for labeling of the GM food, we also have that up in our website as well for, for reference. Mm -hmm. So in terms of labeling, let's say uh, GM that's non-food related, for example, let's say you have a GM oil that you are uh, you're intending to use it for pesticide purposes. Um, then we work together with the pesticide board because they have the labeling uh, requirements, right? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. And if your GMO is used for pesticide, then you know we we, we consult the labeling uh, the pesticide board for the labeling requirements, and um, we inform the the applicant. Yeah. So because like what um, Ponaza was saying, uh, there are multiple stakeholders here, not just Ministry of uh, Environment or uh, DOB, but also the others who are involved, like agriculture, markets, and MOH. Okay, any other discussions here? I'm also being, I'm also very, very active now on gene editing. Aiza okay. is actually organizing a series of webinar on gene editing. And um, I'm also in, well, yesterday I had one conference in Taiwan, but of course from my <laughs> home. And uh, that was on gene editing. And every country is looking at how to editing. And a number mm -hmm. of countries have come out and said that, I hope my internet is good. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, yes. yes, okay. So uh, uh, now countries are looking at how to regulate gene editing and a number of countries are going by case by case. It's not a blanket um, regulation. SDN1, where it's, it is not GMO, it's not going to be regulated. So what is the status uh, as a, I, I, don't, I, I don't see consultation happening in Malaysia yet. So are you going to start a consultation with stakeholders to see how we want to regulate? Well, that is one of the things that, uh, well, it's on our list, but so currently how we how we uh, regulate gene editing currently is case by case. We, uh, we go back to the definition of um, modern biotechnology. So if it is uh, anything in vitro, if the gene editing um, is uh, in vitro, because you know, you can also, you, you, you have to some, they, they are in vitro techniques, then yes, it would be regulated under uh, our act. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you want to speak? You can I unmute as well. So I would just also like to reiterate that uh, maybe, you know, it's important to just always bear in mind the definition of what modern biotech is. So if you are ever yeah. like uh, confused, you just read back the definition and then you'll know. Because we've had also questions where they say, oh, I've made a GMO, but I've done it to you. Mutagenesis, for example, you know, uh, chemical or, or something like that. And I'm like, oh, but it's not in vitro, you know, so it doesn't fall under the yes. act, for example. Yes. Yes. So this year we were supposed to have the COPMOP meeting. 
uh, under the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity in Kunming. And of course, it is all postponed and we are not sure whether it's going to happen next year. But when that happens, AISA organizes the pre-preparatory workshops mm -hmm. so that we can inform uh, stakeholders, those who are going, those who stay at home and, you know, at home meaning in their, in their countries, and give the support to delegates. So we always organize a pre a preparatory workshops for Asia, uh, Asian uh, countries, and um, that has, did not happen as well. So we are looking to organizing it next year. I also uh, posted a link to the short course that AISA and Mabic organizes every year. This has been the third year. And this short mm -hmm. course is um, Asian short course on agribiotechnology, biosafety regulations, and communication. This year, it's going to be hosted by my office in the Philippines. So we mm -hmm. welcome Malaysians uh, to take part in that. You know, we are going to discuss all areas of uh, agribiotechnology, cutting up protocol, including synthetic biology and gene editing as well. Because next year, we are expecting the um, COPMOP to happen, hopefully. Yeah, Azza? Fingers <laughs> crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. There's sure. a lot of unresolved issues and stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. So anyone wants to talk about your experience? As I just want to ask you something uh, because, um, you know, I, I am a strong believer that we have got excellent Biosafety Act regulations. Uh, but one thing I hear from our researchers is about the en enforcement. When enforcement officers go to the facilities premises, they ask a lot of fictional questions like, you know, for example, these are the real questions like um, what happens when you did not wash your hand properly in the lab, you go home, you wash your hand in the sink, and then it goes into the kitchen um, the sink and goes into our uh, waterway. So these are very, very fictional questions. I hope um, something can be done so that enforcement officers really stick to science-based probabilities or possibilities, not mm -hmm. like what we wa uh, watch in Hollywood movies, you know, so all kind of things, and then it just happens. So... Uh, that is what I hear a lot from um, uh, from researchers. Okay. I suppose it may be because, you know, sometimes besides the, you know, looking at the premises and all that, maybe sometimes as in, uh, in enforcement or as a, as because a, some of the, the GMAC members, sometimes they also come for the, the visit. Maybe they might be a little bit more, as a researcher, you're just extra concerned. You know, you just go above and beyond sometimes. But um, I understand, and uh, well, we are always working towards, you know, bettering yeah. ourselves. So yeah. yeah. Any IBC members except for Dr. Subash here from other in, uh, institutes, uh, organizations, and uh, um, universities? You will have your own experience as well. I just want to add um, one thing as well. You know, mm -hmm. just like how when you do animal ethics, uh, if you if you any if you don't have animal ethics committee and then you publish a paper, then the OECD, um, this paper will not be published if they find out that you don't have an animal ethics committee. It need not go through animal proper animal ethics uh, yeah. purview. Mm -hmm. So the same thing with biosafety as well. When your paper is published and they find out that a hey, this is did not come to DOB uh, biosafety and you don't have an IBC. So you can be scrutinized as well. So it's very important that we have IBC and a functioning IBC. And uh, mm -hmm. so people in IBC understand how to, uh, how to support uh, your colleagues. And not just papers per se. Let's say if uh, you want to commercialize a, a product as well, you know, suddenly it's, oh, it's ready for commercialization. And then if you look back like, okay, but where was the uh, biosafety approval uh, during the R&D stage, uh, you know, and that? And then they realize, okay, they're, they're in trouble because they didn't do the, the legwork yeah. of getting the approval. And suddenly they have nowhere to go because the product yeah. is already there, yeah. but there's no yeah. approval. So, you know, then all the years of research and investment goes to waste. So it's very important that we understand the entire process. So that is why even Mabik Aiza, we do a lot of engagements on biosafety. And another thing I want to say here is um, a lot of um, people say that the industry is against biosafety regulations. Actually, this is the opposite. Every industry won biosafety regulations in all the countries. And you know why? Because only then they can do business. If, say, a country does not have a biosafety act law or any instrument, the, especially the multinational companies, they can't do business in that country. They can't 
they can't do field trials they can't do uh, uh, like what uh, ms aza was saying the the environmental release they can't do all these things so so the industry actually is very supportive of biosafety uh, act or instruments in each countries very quiet audience let me see if there's nothing else oh if we have questions after this i'm expecting maybe a lot of questions coming via email maybe <laughs> <laughs> any students here how do you feel are you excited to get uh, get into agri biotechnology it's a very interesting very useful um very very useful field Yeah. and it's it is it's, it's, you know it is really like advancing as well as i said from gm now we are going into gene editing we are going into uh, synthetic biology any students wants to i know there are a few students here doing biotech or bio related courses anything you want to say did you learn from this at least you know now what it takes to be a researcher everyone is very quiet everyone is very quiet let me see if there's any no i don't see any uh, questions maybe i can share my experience one of the project we did um, we yeah. were using uh, on a on a parkinson's model and uh -huh. uh, we wanted to um use a mouse as a model and we used the mammalian cell line as a stem cell where we transfected with the as gene which encodes uh, certain hormones in the brain Mm -hmm. and uh, we i think that was the first application from aims uh, sometime way back in 2014 we applied to nre we got the approval so so that was the my basically we use a cell line we transfected with the we proposed to transfect with the with the plasmid and then put that on to the mouse mm -hmm. so it yeah. involves animals and also cell line and the clone gene clone and we transfected and uh, that project has been successfully completed mm. i think it's a very good important point because i keep saying agri biotechnology actually biosafety act or law and all the regulations is not just for agri biotechnology like what um, ms aza was saying if any recombination but later on if it is going to be for drug then the drug itself will be exempted but the process is regulated while it is under rnd so it could be drug it could be industrial purpose you could be doing bioplastic from uh, recombinant microbes you could be uh, doing um, uh, for animals so and anything it will be regulated as long as it's r and d yeah that's that's well said uh, mm -hmm. dr maha i think as long as we you, any living organism as a genogenetic material but yeah. if you include a additional material inside i think you need an approval either it's e coli mm -hmm. or a bacteria or fungi or a plant or a mouse uh you need to get approval from nre it's important i think most of the universities knows that only ethics animal ethics and human ethics i think biosafety is an important component yeah yeah it is you have to abide by the law and we have to uh, keep on reminding researchers you know it's technically actually it's not anything uh, new in the sense because it's good laboratory practices basically if you already have it in place answering the questions inside the form you know it should be easy because mm. as a good researcher you already have your things in place you already know you know what you're working with uh, what are the the risks you already thought it out and all that you have your sops in place you just need to put them into the the form actually and uh, inform us so uh, it's not something that is you know additional as in like okay you have to come out as in the first place it should already uh, be there you see so it's 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 really um nothing nothing too new or something yeah it's a part of the laboratory practice exactly. good, good laboratory practice i think that we should know we cannot be releasing <laughs> everywhere yeah that's uh, very important yeah i i but i still hear from researchers that there, there's a lot of like duplication as well maybe you know it's already there, everything is there but how can we reduce some paperwork for researchers because you know like as i pointed out rightly that researchers are looking for grants and uh, you know and their students and supervising and all other things so maybe you know we can still see where are the areas for improvement so that there's no duplication of work and and reduce the paperwork as well 
Um, there is a question or comment from um, question from Dr. Gunalan. I'm not sure if this is relevant, but then I'm just going to open this up. Agriculture technology is very vast and sustainable solution. Do you integrate SDGs, especially way forward for sustainable food solutions, especially now for food um, security? But whether it's SDG or not, yeah, it doesn't matter to you, right? Yeah, but I, I, I do you want to comment? Well. Again, our basis is uh, purely scientific assessment. But maybe at the end of the day, when it goes to the board, that's where the social economic part comes in. Maybe if the board wants to look at it and say, like, okay, uh, this is also, uh, uh, you know, it plays a role of, for sustainable food. So for example, if you're doing a GM plant, that maybe can help with sustainable food solutions or something like that, then uh, the board can take this into consideration when making the uh, the decision. So that's the that's why in the act we say that's a, a part for socio economic considerations. Yeah, yeah. I think the SDG okay. will, uh, will, uh, will be relevant for socio economic consideration. Yeah. Just say if, for example, a scientist come up with um, uh, with a new uh, product that can be produced in the bioreactor, and now if our in if our farmers are going to lose their job or our indigenous people are going to lose their livelihood because it's going to be produced in a, a, a bioreactor. Now this is where as um, social economic constitution kicks in, but that does not mean that it will be uh, because social economic is we can or we may take into consideration, but it's not part of the scientific. GMAC will not look at social economic consideration. That's how it is, including if it's halal or haram as well. So just say a scientist wants to put um, a porcine gene into a crop. Now that GMAC, uh, it is safe, but it is safe. Uh, GMAC will say, okay, it is safe, but then it goes to um, NB, NBB, and then NBB will, will now ask uh, the ulama, um, I, I don't know, J Jakim maybe, uh, I don't know what is the uh, agency, probably Jakim and the ulama, and the ulama might say, um, uh, yes, it, this is haram. And what could happen is either NBB say, we don't want this in Malaysia, or NBB will say this is approved, but you very strictly you must label it that it is it is haram so that the Muslims are aware. So this is how you see the flexibility and the labeling and how it comes. Uh, so it's not very restrictive, but it it is all based on the um, NBB and the discussion at that at that point. Dr. Exactly. Subash, uh, Azza, do you want to uh, did I say it correctly? Do you want to say anything about what? No, uh, <laughs> when you took the words out of my mouth, that's exactly what I was going to say. Because so yeah. GMAC at at the at the um, department level, at GMAC's level, it's just purely scientific. So we just look at the risk assessment, management, European, that's it. And then we send the they send all the recommendations to the board, the scientific recommendation. So something could be uh, safe. So for example, uh, from experience, we've had a GM um, carnation, which is uh, safe in terms of biosafety. Uh, GMAC has already said, okay, it's safe and all that. And the, the board has actually approved it. But again, just because the board has approved it in terms of biosafety, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, they have their own policy. For example, uh, flowers from certain countries are not uh, you know, a ban from entering uh, Malaysia and all that. So even though biosafety aspect, we say it's safe, uh, we've approved it, but uh, they still have to get a permit approval from, let's say, other other uh, ministries as well. That is um, out of our our hands. So in yeah. the, that case, like you know, the example you give is the same thing. At the end of this, uh, socioeconomic, we can't say because that's up to to the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Dr. Subash, you said you have got a great question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ma. Uh, for Miss Azarina, I have one question because. Uh, Malaysian Palm Oil Board has successfully done genetic engineering of uh, palm oil. Okay. Uh, sorry, oil palm. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe maybe you can uh, share with the audience. Uh, it is still in uh, polyhouse or it is released to the plantation companies and farmers. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, no. Currently in Malaysia, we do not have any um, commercially uh, commercially planted uh, GMOs. No, so um, most of our, our, not most, all of the GM plans, applications that we have are all still within the uh, R&D stage. So whether they're in a glass house or a, con, uh, a field trial, but it's still all R&D. Yeah, 
and there's also one application from um, rubber, I think, uh, for pharmaceutical compound. Yeah, at the end of the day, that, uh, the product is for pharmaceutical purposes. Yeah. And um, there was one for rice as well. Recently, uh, Mardi was ID. doing something on rice. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, for for any release activities, whether they're R&D, uh, that's they need to go through the public participation. So for yeah. R&D work, uh, field trial, that's why we, we advertise it. We, I mean, the applicant will have to advertise it in the papers to get uh, feedback because this is, a again, a release, you know, environment, and it, it, it involves all of us. Hence mm -hmm. the reason why we let uh, public to give their feedback as opposed to notification because you're just working in your lab. You are a researcher and you get so many of those applications. So there's no need and it's safe. At least we hope it's safe if you follow all your guidelines. It's safe within the lab, so we don't really. That's why we don't get public feedback for 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 your research, your notification research. Yeah, and the public participation is also uh, obligatory because it comes under the Cartagena protocol. So we have to announce it to the public and get public um, uh, input before it is approved for environmental release. Yes. So how we do that is when the applicant. Um, uh, when it's published in the papers, we also put it up on our website. We advertise on our website that uh, you know there is uh, public participation going on for this event. For example, we put it up on our Facebook. Um, so if you follow our Facebook, DO Biosafety, Department of Biosafety Malaysia, you will, you will see the announcement as well. And then we send out emails as well because we would like to encourage participation to um, NGOs, to IBCs, to, to agencies, you know, for, for feedback. Subash, how long uh, more do we have? Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, if uh, there are no any questions, then uh, you can pass it over to uh, MC. Uh, okay, I'm going to do a last call mm -hmm. if there are any questions or if you want to speak. Anyone? Okay, I don't see anything. So with that, uh, as a moderator, I would like to thank Juan um, uh, Azam for her very excellent um, presentation, very informative, comprehensive, and she covered all aspects. And uh, that's really, really very useful. And uh, what I would like to say as a moderator is uh, let's move on. You know, we need to move on from uh, uh, genetic modification to gene editing uh, and synthetic biology because we are training so many graduates in bio, bi bi uh, biology. I mean, AIMS has got an excellent biotech uh, course. And I always say, you know, if you want to do biotech, go to AIMS. Um, so many other universities, UPM and UKM, USM, everyone has got this. And where are these people going to go? So we need to create that industry for them and research facilities for them. So for that, we need to have a robust science-based biosafety uh, act and the implementation process as well. And as I said, as countries are moving towards um, now, you know, they're all discussing gene editing, uh, uh, DSI, for example, uh, which is digital sequence uh, information mm -hmm. and synthetic biology, we cannot be still, you know, not ev um, uh, even, uh, what's that? Um, we, are, we cannot be ignorant about biosafety for GM itself when countries are moving to gene editing. So we need to move on. We need to make sure that we comply to this and then move on to the next uh, emerging technologies. So with that, I wish everyone the best. And I really wish that we, uh, Malaysia, will be one of the players in this field. But at the same time, taking into consideration all the risk, and we do risk assessment, risk management in a science-based manner. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maha, for moderating the section. Ms. Azarina, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. It was a great session today. On behalf of the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone for attending our third program of the Biosafety and Biosecurity Month October 2020. Before ending the session, we would like to hear feedback from all participants by scanning the code on the screen right now. We promise the evaluation survey would not take you more than one minute. Your feedback will be greatly appreciated. You can either scan the QR code or go to the link below. The link will be provided in a chat box as well in a short while. After the completion of the survey, you will receive an instant participation certificate. And I will keep this light running for two more minutes for you all to scan the card. We're looking forward to have you all joining us again in the next section. Thank you again, everyone, for, and we wish you a good health and safety.
I hope everyone has the chance to scan the QR code and I'm going to end the meeting. See you soon in our next webinar. Stay safe and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.